Can we start now? Yeah. Yeah, we got yeah. people. They're here. Let's do it. So, okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to Malaysian webinar viewers and a very good evening to you as webinar viewers. And greetings to everyone across the globe. So uh, welcome to the webinar of suicide prevention, the role of parents presented to you by the Association of Muslima in Nature and Advocacy, AMNA, and Michigan State University, MSU. Today, we will be discussing about suicide and what parents can do to help our children. Okay. Uh, so the World Health Organization, WHO, states that in every 40 seconds, somebody dies by suicide, which is more than people dying by war and homicide put together. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among 15 to 29 years old, while 79% of global suicides occur in low and middle income countries. Every suicide is a tragedy that affects families, communities, and the entire countries and has long lasting and devastating effects on the people left behind. We are lucky today that we are joined by three esteemed panelists on our discussion for today's topic. Our first speaker is Dr. Halim Naim from Muslim Mental Health Movement. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Halim. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Okay, our second speaker is Dr. Farha Abbasi from Michigan State University. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Farha. Selamat pagi, Malaysia. Yes, yeah, selamat pagi, Dr. Farha. Okay. And selamat petang. Good evening for you. <laughs> now I got to do my thing. Okay, I see you <laughs> Okay, and uh, our third speaker is Associate Professor Dr. Siti Aisha Hassan from AMNA. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi and a very good evening to USA and selamat pagi. Salam ma'al hijrah to all of us Muslim. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, salam Okay, so now let me begin with the introduction of our first speaker, Dr. Halim Naim. Dr. Halim Naim is a leader in the Muslim mental health movement. Dr. Naim has sat on multiple boards of organizations ranging from civic engagement, educational, religious, and professional mental health. He is published in magazines, books, articles, speaks at numerous conferences and conventions on spiritual, psychological, and masculinity issues, and most importantly, he is a proud father of three beautiful children. Over to you, Dr. Naim, Dr. Halim. All righty, all righty, we got, we got 15 minutes here, so that's perfect yes. timing. Look at me, right at, okay, so I'm gonna do, okay. Here we go. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah, and and our prayers and the peace of Allah may eternally be on our Master, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, people by now know what suicide is. It's the conscious and voluntary taking of your own life. It has occurred for thousands of years. So you don't really need an introduction to it and to the concept right now. There's a lot of angles we can come at it with. And today we talk about uh, prevention. That's been a big thing. Um, that, that's the overall theme, prevention. But I want to go into that. That'll come later with our other esteemed speakers, but I want to talk about what, how, and what type of effect it has on our young populations, not just in America, but in Malaysia. Looking up the World Health, World, World Health Organization statistics, um, talking to different professionals and experts and things like that, it is... Um, 
since 2010, it has been increasing. I don't exactly know what happened in 2010 in Malaysia, but it's on its way back up in the past 10 years. In America, it's right now, as it stands in Malaysia, before we hop to America, it's the second leading cause of death among youth who are 15 to 19 years old. And there's a lot of ways young people pass away. But what is scary and what is something that we need to look at as a Muslim community, as a, how do we say, masyarakat Islam? Oh, you didn't think I know that, did you? Um, <laughs> as we, as we, um, as we, as we mobilize as a, as a community, as a people, it's our duty and our responsibility to intervene on this, okay? Now, I don't exactly know all the nuances of why a youth in another culture would commit suicide. There's, but my guess would be there would be a lot of similarities. However, I do know what happens and why in our culture, <laughs> the number of, um, we have whole Netflix series, um, 13 Reasons Why, and, and other um, psychological suspense, thrillers, dark documentaries, things like that, of youth who are taking their own lives. I have a, um, I'm not going to read the letter, but I always keep this letter right here that I got offline about a, um, about a young girl who was sexually abused and, um, and the torment and the depression and the hatred, the self-hatred that comes in uh, led her to suicide. People with body image issues, people who have lack of purpose, people who feel empty, people who are disconnected from, who feel disconnected from their parents, from their family, okay? This is, um, there is a fundamental disconnect, but what I'll tell you in this society and what I would, what I would want to explore with my Muslim and Malaysian brothers and sisters in the other cultures and other, in, 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 our, in our other culture, in our sister culture and, and society is what goes on in the mind of a person who has decided to take their own life, a young person that is told, usually, you got so much life ahead of you. You want, you want to, you, you're, you're just beginning, you're just getting started with life. What goes on? And one of the connections that I see in this society is that the fundamental the fundamental, the fundamental characteristic or the basic uh, thing that I find in common is that there is severe and a critical point of hopelessness. It's hopelessness for the most part. Nine, nine and a half, 9.8 times out of 10. It is hopelessness. There are some people who are literally by schizophrenia that are, that are tormented. And I'm saying young people because the onset of a lot of schizophrenic and bipolar and psychotic disorders are in that age range. But when you're talking about internalized hopelessness, internalizing that there is no other option, there is no other option than to destroy your body to get rid of your life, to, to completely escape all of this pain and suffering. When, when that gets to a critical point, that is when you see, that is when you see the, the suicide rates just go out of control. And people of all ages do it. We're just saying that one of the highest rates and particularly right now in America, as of about three or four years ago, based on the, some of the research, 
but because it, you know it takes time to collect and gather and things like that and it's always coming in new but the highest rate in america and one of them and one of them in the world were young women girls ages 14 to 18 so there's something about this beginning of adulthood this before life begins this this adolescence um there's so many things that happen and so many feelings and so many experiences that are so powerful and a lot of things happen at a very deep level for the first time in young people and so when you don't feel like there is a way to figure it out or a way to reconcile or a purpose or a way to connect the things that are going on around you or inside of you that is when you start to see this behavior. I've seen it in a couple types, even though there's a spectrum. And what I mean of a couple types are the, the, the conviction to do it. Usually there are those who cry out for help as youngsters, as, as teenagers, as adolescents, they'll cry out for help in a lot of different ways. And the scary ones are where you don't see it coming. Like they've already made up their mind. That's why we ask for a plan, a place, means, um, time, everything. Because it's already there. Or at least they have a pretty strong idea and some other options of how they would commit that act, okay? And it's devastating, it hurts. And, and what keeps a lot of people alive is, is the um, anticipated pain that it actually causes other people. Um, it's, just, it's just devastating. And having people who are close to you I had a young, whew, I had a young, um, a young lady that, you know, used to go to our mosque here in America and, um, and she was 18 when she took her life. And while people saw some of the dysfunction in her life, um, nobody saw it coming that way. And so you have people who cry out for help, but what is scary and what is becoming increasingly popular is for a letter or something to drop or some, some way of coming to closure, saying goodbye, parting, gift, whatever, and it just happening out of nowhere. So there are a number of, um, it's devastating, it's heart-wrenching, and um, makes you wonder why and how and what you could do and was it your fault and, you know, everything. Why didn't I see it and all that? We only got a couple minutes left. And there's a lot, you know, I'm just kind of broad stroking, just a number of things with our youth and young people. But um, this is our future and our future can't be um, taken away and taking ourselves away. So the only way that we're going to be able to stop one of the worst pandemics you know, we're talking about Corona, but she just said 800,000 people every year die from their own hands. We're just in, we're just about to reach that in Corona. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less. And you see how it's turned the world upside down. But this has been here. And so it is going to take 
our whole society and our whole world and every society and every culture within themselves to really look at policies and to really look at ways that we can save our own kids, to save our own children, to save Ana Anakita, right? So I implore you, my 15 minutes are up, but I implore you, the way that things begin here is through conversation. And then, then after conversation comes some level of collaboration, working together, coming together, and then hopefully some action, some intervention, and something comes out, inshallah. So with that, while there's more to say, we will, uh, we will uh, submit the remainder or whatever time we are indebted to our next esteemed panelists. We thank you so much and Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa Thank you very much, Dr. Halim Naim. Very enlightening sharing. So I will proceed with the introduction of our second speaker. Dr. Farha Abbasi is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Michigan State University and co-faculty member of the Muslim Studies Program. Her areas of interest are cultural psychiatry and teaching medical students how to provide culturally appropriate care to Muslim patients. She is the founding director of the annual Muslim Mental Health Conference. She is also the managing editor of the Journal of Muslim Mental Health and director of the Muslim Mental Health Consortium, Michigan State University. She has served on many boards and committees, including Council on Minority Mental Health and Health Disparities American Psychiatric Association. She is currently chairs the Mental Health Task Force for the Mayor of Lansing, Michigan. She works relentlessly and tirelessly towards one goal, learning to coexist and go beyond our differences to reach the common point of peace and prosperity. Now over to you, Dr. Farha. So thank you so much uh, for this uh, great introduction and thank you for continuing to do this amazing work in creating mental health awareness in uh, uh, Malaysia. We always look forward to working with the, the Dr. Shah, Satisha, and all of you. So thank you for that. Like uh, my uh, colleague said, Dr. Halim Naim, that suicide can be an act of despair, anger, uh, or escape from intolerable pain, intolerable psychological pain. And it's a combination of social isolation, hopelessness, and self-loathing. Um, and there's this perceived sense of lack of support. So even if there are, they are surrounded by family and friends, they can't in their negative mindset and their despair and their psychic pain, they can't really perceive the strength they have around. And it's very interesting when I was looking up numbers and doing my research that I discovered that the ambiguity of not taking your life stays with them till the last minute. It's almost like they, they want to die, they want to not feel this pain anymore, but they, till the last minute, are hoping to be rescued as well. So, of course, we can't put enough emphasis on how important creating this support system around them becomes. Um, this support system can come from families, from loved ones, from friends, from the society. So we really need to uh, create work around them. That's said and done. It doesn't mean that there are, no, there are some predictable behaviors which is the most, uh, uh, like Dr. Halim already alluded to, that the most telling sign is a change, sudden change in behavior. So if they were very happy, uh, go lucky kind of social people, 
they might start social isolation, they might start cutting off friends, they might start giving up their uh, favorite things, or it can go the other way around too, that they might be feeling very sad and depressed, but once they have made the decision to kind of complete this act of self-harm, that they feel this relief, the burden is lifted and they suddenly might be, appear more cheerful and happy. And we saw that in case of a few uh, celebrities that we saw, uh, Anthony Bourdain or Robin William, that people couldn't really predict that this is what they are planning. They were on top of their careers. So how can we kind of, it's and of course it's a huge loss it's a huge loss so the idea when we talk about family and parental support the idea is not that in some way we we can we have a very clear map that if you do this 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 that there will be no uh, self-harming behavior in our loved ones but the idea is can we do more can we create more uh, supportive network for them for ourselves that we kind of maybe can intervene at that last minute, the hope that they have of being rescued, that they have lost within themselves, we can find it for them. So um, that said and done, I talk about three tools which are very important. First of all, extremely, extremely important to have cohesive family systems. But cohesive family systems don't mean that you are into each other's space or completely disconnected. Cohesive means a safe area where they grow. They feel nurtured. They feel supported. They feel validated. They feel heard, and but with very nice, uh, clear boundaries. So cohesive families can bring that innate sense of uh, self-preservation of being loved that they have walked away from, they have forgotten. So families, if they are supportive and validating, can so they can give them that safe space that they come out and talk about their struggles. Um, then comes if the family itself has gone through trauma and is disruptive, how can we then create a more adhesive kind of family, which is more in a survival mode, more in coping mode? Like, okay, we didn't have that from childhood. We all suffered traumas like divorce or death of loved ones or moving away. But right now, how can we be each other's surviving partners? And of course, there, would, there are still people which do not have any support system around them, then how can they create that supportive new families around them, which is their therapist, the provider, um, other uh, social organizations, religious organizations, all that, how can they keep them, uh, take them over that uh, few seconds where they kind of give in to the despair. So three basic tools I talk about is empathy, empowerment, and engagement. Empathy is being in their shoes. So you don't go out and tell them that this is how you should be handling it. This is how you should be feeling, or you should be praying more or doing this more. Instead of that, just being in that holding environment, holding them and saying, how, how are you coping? How can I be there in this journey with you? How can I help you cope? So literally standing with them in their shoes, in their pain. Um, empowerment is, empowerment. So not, empowerment comes from validation, feeling heard, feeling secure. We are feeling that not being judged, being accepted for who they are. And that is extremely important because their own self-worth and self-esteem is at the lowest. And if you don't become that safe space where they, you empower them, then they, they, that's where the internal pain and conflict gets become a too heavy burden to carry. So empower, 
development is important. And of course, other thing is engagement. So if you have concerns or you are picking on signs and you are very worried like what's happening with your loved ones or friends or people in the community, then don't leave them alone because the, it, it takes 30 seconds of social engagement to get them away from the sense of isolation. So it's sending them text, sending them uh, gifts, or calling them, checking on them, stopping by, baking, making food for them, just keeping uh, engaged, that continuously validating that, uh, them for th that you are needed, you are important, that we all want you here so that they can walk away from that conflict and despair. So again, uh, empathy, empowerment, and engagement. But in the last, uh, I would like to say one important message we all have to remember that suicide is not an ethical, moral, spiritual, religious, or medical failure. It is a person's innate and immense sense of loss and despair. And it's extremely important to remember that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Farha Abbasi, for the informative, very informative uh, sharing. Now, last but not least, I would like to introduce our third panelist for today, Dr. Siti Aisha Hassan. Associate Professor Dr. Siti Aisha Hassan is from Department of Counselor Education and Counseling Psychology, Faculty of Educational Studies, University Putra, Malaysia. She is actively involved in various research projects, especially those related to marital, couple and family counseling, post-traumatic stress disorders among flood victims, and practice of Islamic psycho-spiritual approaches, a unique approach for Muslim clients. As the founder and director of Puas Sendiran Berhad, she has successfully put research into practice of her empirically tested counseling models and intervention under the incentive of Inoha Putra Science Park, UPM, since 2015. In 2018, she was invited as a special guest speaker for presenting her innovative model of Makosit Sharia Discernment Counseling at Oxford Family Counseling Institute. In 2019, she presented it at the Global Muslim Mental Health Conference, Cambridge University, United Kingdom. Over to you, Dr. Siti Aisha. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good uh, morning to Malaysians and a good evening to USA and all of us in around the world. Alhamdulillah, thank you very much for the very um, nicely introductions and uh, um, as all as the notice that we have 15 minutes to talk a very 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 serious issues about suicide inshallah i'll try my best to talk let me uh, i've uh, i've heard that uh, dr farha uh, focusing on uh, 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 this angle from the professional mental health and also uh, Dr. Halim Naim, from the perspective of Masharakat, of Muslim Ummah, I would like to focus this on the, from uh, the parental perspective, where uh, as uh, the topic is the parent roles for, uh, to prevent suicide. So does uh, really, does parent has the role? Do parent actually powerful enough to prevent suicide? What do we do? These are the questions. So let me start introduction, how I get involved in this field, counseling, psychology, or counseling, uh, guidance and counseling, okay? When I started my, uh, when I had my, when I was in the United States back in 1988, in 1990, I gave birth for my first son. I was all alone, delivered, I mean, alone with my husband at that time, was, uh, and I didn't know how to raise a child. 
And I was very young, about 21 at that time. And I was alone. When I said alone, I am not surrounded with my, my parents, my siblings, my sister. I'm the, I'm the youngest. So I didn't know how to, 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 to raise a child. And I, every day I call my sisters and how to do this, how to do that. And I said, oh, this doesn't work. So I have to enroll a community class. And from that, I, I know that, oh, so knowledgeable is, you know, there is so much knowledge that we, we can learn when we enroll in a class, when we put things seriously. So from that, I know this is the area where I, I, I would like to involve more. My, 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 my degree was chemistry. So when I started enroll in this community class, parenting class, I learned a lot. And one thing that I learned that I still remember until today, that when we have a second child, the, the first child is always remain as the king of the family. He will never be dethroned. However, the second one is as special as the first one. So as a parent, number one, I would suggest that never ever compare your first child with the second child with the third child never ever each of our child is unique in their own way i still i want to share one of my experience in raising my kids the second child muzakir he said that oh i want to be like my brother you know he is very smart his handwriting is very beautiful everyone praise him from his handwriting, my handwriting is so messy and I don't like my handwriting. And I said to my son, when he was seven years old, look son, Muzakir, you are very special in your own way. You don't have to be like your brother. Look at you, you are so friendly, you're so active. I love the way you are who you are. You are very unique, very special in your own way. You don't have to be like your brother. And this thing actually really, really impacted him in his life. I know. When he was 15 years old, 16 years old, they were, both the brothers are in the same school, in a boarding school. The brother want to laugh. We sent in a boarding school, a religious school. The brother want to laugh uh, at 16 years old. He decided to move back from Kelantan with the grandparents' place to back to KL. And then I asked Muzakir, the second brother, would you like to follow your brother to come back to KL instead of staying in Kelantan school there? Look, mom, I'm not my brother. I'm myself. I am unique my own way. Oh, really? MashaAllah. I, I said, thanks God. What I said to him when he was seven years old is really ingraining himself. Said, I am unique in my own way. I have lots of friends. Look, I mean, if one friend lives back to KL, I have hundreds and hundreds of friends here. I don't have to follow my friends. So in that way, when they were very small, we start to talk that they are unique in their own way. Do not compare them with their siblings. Do not compare them with the neighbors. Do not compare them with the cousins. Do not compare them with anybody. They are unique in their own way. This is a very important. Make them feel special each day. I'm sorry to say I'm not a perfect mother, but I'm trying. The very reason when I pursue my PhD with this very, uh, I would say selfish reason, because I want to be the best parent, the best mom in the world for my kids, not for my PhD at the end of my name, not because I want to be professors, it, it was not my dream at all to do that. I want to do my PhD because I want to know more how to be the best mom in this world. I'm going to run and take this medal that I received from my child. Thank you, Dr. Siti Aisha. Yeah, this. Okay. So I get oh, this, all right. the best mom in the world. The comeback. All right. <laughs> yeah. So the, can you see that? 
<laughs> yes, yeah. yes, we can yeah. say that. Yeah, yeah, the best mom. Okay, no, wow. I, I, I want, I, I want that. I want, I want, uh, I want to be the best mom. I know I'm not a perfect mom, but I want to be the best mom for my kids. Uh, of course, this uh, when we go through challenges, life adversity, uh, it never is far from a perfect life in this in 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 the family when we we become a parents. But as Dr. Far said, they always feel supported. They always feel needed. At times, you are facing problem yourself as a mother, but you know that you are trying your best. And what most important, they feel that despite whatever adversity, you're always there. So in the last minute, I want to share my research, uh, enough of my personal experience. I want to share some of my research. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, how can I do that? Um, oh, how can I do that? I'm going to share my screen. Or can you can uh, click on your screen and then there's a green button saying share screen. All right. I'm getting nervous. I do not know how to do that now. Okay, uh, put your put your cursor anywhere uh, on the screen. Okay, uh-huh. Okay, and then uh, there's a green uh, button below. All right. Uh, put, uh, put your cursor okay, I down. I got it, I got it. Okay, All I got right, it. share screen. Okay. Click on your share screen. Okay, can everybody see my screen now? Can yes, you see my right. screen? Yeah, yeah okay. Yes, yeah. yeah. So the, the title of the research is uh, Maternal Quality Time, Adolescent Intelligence and Sexual Activities and Islamic Empirical Interventional Model, okay? So this uh, research has been conducted by 11 phases. I want you to focus on this, uh, this part, the, the, the conceptual framework, okay? Now, basically, when I start uh, 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 this research, I want to know when people were talking in the early 90s, they're talking about quality time, quality time. What is that? How are we going to do that? And then during my PhD, I conducted a research and I found that what when we have a very limited time. So what what do we do best within our within this very limited time as a mom, especially as a working mother or even as as a stay at home mom, we have a lot of things to do at home. How do we make sure that the time that we spend with our kids, they feel supported, they feel attached, they do not feel disengaged. So these are the three main components. Number one, you have to have this spiritual characteristic. In the, what does it mean by spiritual characteristic? Number one, you have to have merciful you have to be very merciful to your child you always want to one of the example you always want to to smile and praise and hug these are very simple acts that we always overlook when they are adolescents we only kiss a little baby when they start growing become uh, adolescents 11 12 we start uh, or they start to feel very weird to kiss my son, even he's married, I still hug him and kiss him. And my husband said, oh, you think it's still appropriate? Yes, I do. He's my son. He's still my baby. And then uh, kissing, hugging, these are so important. We always underestimate the power of touch and kissing and hugging our kids. Even they are grow up. So be merciful, be so, so gentle. Number two, uh, be very accountable, especially uh, girls, even boys. I mean, I do not know for my kids, if they come back home after 11, they are not home. I start to text them. I start to call them. Where are you? You are still not at home. It's always clear you have to come back home very, you know, before at 11, you should be at home. 
And sometimes they forget. And I have to call. This is, you have to be really accountable where about your child, what they are doing is parenting is no joke. It's really a hard, difficult job to do. And of course, above all, we have to be pious, all in all. I remember when I worry about my, my daughter, he come back home late and I call, he didn't, didn't, she didn't pick up my, my phone and I start to worry, oh, where is she? What happened to her? Why? She's being kidnapped or what? She's a girl. It's, it's about more than 11 p.m. What happened to her? And I start to worry. And then my husband said, come on, if you start being anxious, anxiety, it helps nothing. Take wudu, go and pray. Pray to Allah so that he can save your daughter, your beloved daughter. Nobody can save her at this moment because we cannot get contact. And then some, you know, few minutes later, she come home and said, what happened to you? Why did you pick up your, my call? Say, my phone out of battery. Simple as that. You know, we, we're just being anxious. Nobody can help us except at that point of time, no one, when we are so worried so much about our child, no one but God can help us, can help our kid. Always, when you are so worried so much, nobody can help but God. So being merciful, being accountable, being pious, always rely on God and raising our kids. We always pray Him that we do not know much except Him, the Creator, know most on how to raise our kids. Number two is mother-child attachment. This is from Bowlby Attachment Theory, saying that uh, from Bowlby Attachment Theory, they have not to be, they have to feel like the, the family, parents, mother, especially as the significant others, has to be the secure based, safe haven. When they feel they have challenges out there, you are the one that they want to refer when they have problems. And of course, a very simple to say, but it's not easy to say, do not criticize them when they are having problems. Oh, you should have do this, you should have do that. Then this problem will not occur. I mean, no way they will share their problem again with you. So trying to be understanding, don't make them feel that they make things wrong. It's never right in, their, in our eyes. So this is number one, make them feel very secure. We are safe heaven when they have problem to share their problem and make they are not... Hmm? They do not feel alienated. They are at home, but nobody can understand them. This is the issues. Uh, attachment theory. And shed time, maternal shed time. We have to have time. Each of the child need to have our special time with them. Sometimes we bring them as a family, but there are times between you and this child, the other time between first child, the other time then with the second child, third child, I have five. Each one of them, they need a very special private time. So these are among uh, my research, my PhD research and ongoing research. And uh, empirical evidence shows that if we continuing doing this, Inshallah, with the God blessing, we can help increase our emotional children, emotional intelligence. They are more aware of their own emotions, whether they're feeling sad, or they're feeling depressed. They they increase how to manage of their own emotions, and at the same time, when they can manage their emotions, they can help increase the academic performance and most likely they will not get involved in sexual misconduct. Among the, among the uh, uh, causes of uh, suicide in Malaysia, uh, uh, female adolescents especially, when they get involved in sexual misconduct, when they get pregnant, when they got pregnant, 
they choose either to do an illegal abortion or to kill themselves because they don't because they feel they are wrong they don't feel that the parent will support them they feel that they are outcasted they feel that uh in malaysia we call it sampah masyarakat it mean the the trash of the society so they feel that it is so painful that they some of them as uh, dr far said they do not want to get engaged in this one sometimes they are being sexually abused so when they have this if we do not become the safe haven they will not share their problem and they will end up with that another pressure from the kids when when they commit suicide is that the parent put pressure on their academic performance and we there are cases right after the exam result announced we'll find some kids 12 years old 15 years old kill themselves because they do not meet their parent expectations so so i would like to share some of my tips how i make my children less anxiety i tell my kids i do not award you after the exam i award you based on your process i award you right before uh, the exam coming out the exam result not right before just once they finish sitting for the exam they finish like they finish in SPM or I give you the biggest exam in Malaysia is SPM is the national certificate. Like they, they started to have the exam in, 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 in uh, November oh, and then they end up in December. So after they finish the exam, I will reward them based on their effort, based on the effort, how much effort they do in, in handling the exam. If they, I can see the, the, I can see at home, I can see uh, during the school holidays when they are in the boarding school, how much effort they, they put and I will reward them uh, right after they finish the exam. And when the result come out, about to come out, I will remind them, I'm so proud of you. You have put your full effort. I know that. I, I didn't say that I already reward them right after the exam, I reward them. I get, I say that my rule is that I reward based on effort, not based on your result. Because result is, I, we live to God. So whatever result come up tomorrow, son, daughter, first thing I want you to do is make sujud syukur. Thanks to God for whatever result, you get straight A, you don't get straight A, you get whatever. It doesn't matter to me because what most important is that you have put effort. So you have to be grateful to yourself because have you, you have to put effort. Most important, you have to be grateful to God, giving you the best result. The best result does not mean straight A. The best result means whatever best to you, God know best. So make whatever result, make Sujud syukur. Thanks God for giving the best result for me. Only he knows what is the best result. So there's less anxiety. Of course, there are anxiety, but very less because we don't demand anything from the result. Whatever result you get, I already reward you earlier. I'm not going to give you any more reward. You get straight A, you don't get straight A. It's not rewarded. I rewarded you before. So Alhamdulillah, I've seen that they are less anxious and this is the way that I think some tips that I want to share with with all audience here. With that, I end. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Dr. Siti Aisha. Now, moving on, um, we shall have a question and answer session for all our viewers. I want to end the... the, the, the so you can uh, yeah, stop yeah. sharing. That's an yeah. option. On top of your screen. Oh, on top of the screen. All right. Yeah. It's a red color. Okay, got it. All right. Thank All you. All right. So thank you, Dr. Siti. Now I will pass the floor to my friend Bashira. She will be reading the written questions for, for our panelists. Bashira, over to you. All right. Jazakallahu khairan kasira and thank you, Ayman. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and peace be upon you. 
My name is Bashira and now the speakers will answer some questions that were sent to us through the registration form. If you still have the questions, please don't be shy to write it down in the chat section. All right, so moving on. So the first question is, lack of parental support is one of the major causes of committing suicide. How can one survive in such an environment where he or she has a weak social support system? I would like to open these questions to any speakers who wants to answer it. We, uh, we can start with you, Hali, and each take 30 seconds each. Yeah. What was the question? So, <laughs> right. I can take uh, it. Okay, so okay. the th thing is, um, I, I already alluded to it, that it is about finding your tribe. It is finding and creating that support system. And it can come in a form of community. It can come in form of religious community. It can come in form of extended family, friends, um, or social organizations, being in therapy, your therapist. Um, so it is extremely important that if you are aware that you have tendency to get to that point of depression and despair, um, then it is important that you also advocate for yourself, find that kind of network and create that network around you. There are mm -hmm. crisis hotlines. There are um, uh, people now, even on Facebook now, if you put depression or suicide, Facebook take no notice of, of it. So um, just reach out. There are a lot of people uh, feeling the same way and uh, that can create that network and support for you. All right, okay. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Farha. Okay, move on to the next questions. Um, second question is, un unsuccessful attempted suicide cannot be charged as criminals in courts of law. Can Dr. Siti Aisha share your opinion on that? Um, so I would just like to point out one thing, that mm -hmm. uh, in the field of uh, suicide prevention and suicide mm -hmm. ideology, we do not use the word commit anymore. Because I see. Like an act of uh, like you are committing sin kind of. It is like... So yeah, so attempting and completing, is that a crime, Dr. Satisha? Yes, attempting suicide, okay. Attempting suicide? What was okay. the question yeah. again, can you repeat? Yes, uh, unsuccessful attempted suicide, not to charge as criminals in courts of law. Attempting? Yes, attempting. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, someone trying, uh, trying to suicide and not successful. Yes. Right. Okay. Should it be charged as criminals in cause of law? Um, you are asking about law. I'm sorry to say it. I, I'm not the expert I in can, law. I can comment on that again. Absolutely not. Uh, because mm -hmm. it is not a crime. It is an act of helplessness and pain. And we should not aggravate it. If we make it legal, to uh, mm -hmm. make it a crime, then you are just... Uh, kind of uh, uh, falling into the trap of the, that it's a sin, that it's under their control, and that they're willingly doing this. So we have to move away from that and understand the pathophysiology of depression, that how you get to that point. So absolutely no. I see. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would agree. I would agree with uh, uh, Dr. Farha because uh, when we uh, have in TV or clients who commit who attempt to commit suicide, it's actually they 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 do not plan to die. They rather want to end the pain. The, the, the pain inside them, they want to end the pain. Not is that they actually want to end their life. It, the, the pain is unbearable. So they cut uh, they cut their wrist so that they can feel the pain of cutting the wrist so that they forget their emotional pain. If that doesn't work after a few attempts, they want to jump or do anything more so that they can run from that painful emotions problem, uh, that, that, that feeling of painful. 
So this is from from I don't have many many clients who attempted suicide, but I do some. But that's uh, suicide is is not really my 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 specializations. Rather, uh, couples and family in general having not not really much on suicide. But I do have a a few uh, clients who having kids uh, or themselves uh, trying or attempt to commit suicide yes this is what what i discovered they want to end the pain not actually their life so uh no this is how i can say and uh, criminalizing that i don't think that's the best solutions no i don't mm -hmm. think so uh, all right, thank you, Dr. Siti and Dr. Farha. So um, it brings me to the next questions regarding the cutting hands. Okay, one of the participants' friends told me that uh, told her that cutting hands or wrists is popular among Indians. Is this true, or it happens across some of the cultures? Can you answer? So that? again, I can take that question. Uh, it happens in all the cultures. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and what happens is, again, when you are in that much pain, you feel very numb, and it is to feel real, again, that they uh, attempt to cut. But what happens actually is that the good mood hormone endorphins and, mm -hmm. and serotonin is released by brain. So whenever your body is in pain or is cut or hurt, your brain wants to dampen the pain and releases this endorphins, dopamine and serotonin so that the pain is not felt. So when you cut, actually, there is this rush of good mood hormones. So they feel the relief. So one thing is they, they feel so numb that when they cut, they feel alive, they feel real. They, they feel like, okay, I still exist, but the release of endorphins also give them the rush and improve, feel, makes them feel better for a little. All right, okay. It's not culturally, in, like I, I don't think it's, it's not culture. in comparison to the other, but definitely mm -hmm. the gender difference. So what happens is men, um, in, more than women, tend to uh, indulge in self-harm more because they find it very hard to express depression and stress and stigma around it. So they, they tend to uh, indulge in self-harming behaviors more. All right. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Farha. So for the next question, I would like Dr. Halim to answer it. Um, okay. How do we reach out to, this, to someone who we don't see it coming, attempting suicide? Sorry, what was the question again? How do we reach out to someone? Yeah, how do we reach out to the one whom we don't see it coming to attempt suicide? It's like unexpected person. So how do we reach out for that person? Darling. Darling, can you answer it? Um, I don't know. I, um, I mean... There's books and there's things that tell you, like, you know, do a lot of preventative things and have a good relationship and, you know, always ask questions and um, check in and do preventative things. But um, when a person, the scary thing about it is when a person that you don't have as much control over like a child, um, you know, it's easier to stop a child from doing certain things. Yes. But when an adult wants to do it, um, then if I knew how or knew the answer to that question, there'd be some more people alive in this world. So I don't want to scare people. I would just say, looking back, I wish that I took certain, I knew more about what was going on in a person's life and took some of the signs more seriously. Because I don't know if anybody here, anybody on this panel or the panelists can claim like, yeah, 
I caught somebody from stop somebody from doing suicide that I didn't know they were going to do it. I don't think anyone can say that. So I'm not going to tell you how, cause I don't know. You know, I know as a PhD or, and you know, panelists and stuff, you know, you're supposed to know everything or have a question or have an answer to this, but I don't know. So I guess the only thing I would suggest or would advise is really know as much as you can, you know, mm -hmm. about what's going on with the people you care about. And if there is some red flags, like some of the things we discussed, just take it more seriously. Mm -hmm. What about Dr. Farha? What happens is that they, the literature shows that those who have completed suicide that they might have had seen a therapist or a psychiatrist at least six within six months period. So, and they usually, they do not express their thoughts of hurting themselves that much to their, to their psychiatrist or therapist for the fear that if they do tell us that, oh, I'm gonna, I'm thinking of hurting myself, then of course we, it's mandatory on us to hospitalize them. So in order to avoid that, they tend to minimize it, unfortunately. But that said and done, once uh, after an unsuccessful attempt, th uh, there's likely chances of them being in therapy and in treatment. So that is the moment to really be there for them and look at all possibilities, how, but, the strength has to come from within. So that's what, what Dr. Halim Naim is saying is, yes, we all can try, but somebody who has made up their mind, it is very hard to uh, predict or prevent. But what we can do is that given the chance that when they do reach out to us after an unsuccessful attempt, that that's the moment you can really do your best in empowering them creating that innate need to survive, the inner confidence, the inner self-love. So you go back to uh, usually what I do is you, you tend to find out that even in this despair, what is one thing that kind of bring a smile to them or can bring some hope to them. In some people, it can be grandkids. In some people, it can be a loved one or a pet or a, a social or religious legacy. So you, you kind of do that, your work around that in creating that innate uh, strength. But um, yes, unfortunately, no easy solution. No one plus one answers here. All right. Um, so Dr. Huda Abuasi mentioned in the chat room that there are many signs of suicide and it is preventable. All we need is to assess for the risk and look for signs and encourage dialogue. Okay, um, so it brings us to the next question. What are the signs a person wants to commit suicide? Can Dr. So, um, I know what Dr. Huda is referring to, Huda Abbas is referring to you, that mm -hmm. things could be that they become very socially isolated, they become depressed, they stop... Uh, engaging in their academics and their relationships. They start giving up their um, possessions. Uh, but what we are realizing that that's one way that we, so you, there are two ways people complete suicide. One thing is very premeditated, thought out, planned uh, time and event. But some cases what happens is sheer moment, in a sheer moment, they act out. That's why we always say that there shouldn't be firearms around or there shouldn't mm -hmm. be medication because they, when people are going through depression, uh, diagnosed or undiagnosed, they can at sometimes act in sheer moment of it. Like, let's say I get some really terrible news. Like we have had a medical student who found out she failed and went home and there was no sign of depression. She wasn't depressed. Just getting her result in that sheer moment, she took her life. So we have to understand that, that 
if he can see signs and patterns if it's a premeditated attempt. But if they're acting in a moment of desperation, even it comes as a surprise to even them. Till that moment, they, they didn't think they are gonna do this. So we, uh, we can, again, one prediction, I can only say previous attempts, family history, um, and uh, uh, recent trauma, recent losses, recent case of suicide around them, all these mm -hmm. uh, red flags that you have to look for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, right now, true self-harm is becoming a trend, okay? Uh, right, cutting risk. So there is a participant asking, how close is it related to suicide? Can Dr. Siti answer it? Okay, um, cutting risk, I, I did mention just now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, as, as uh, I mentioned just now, they don't really, to some of them, they don't really mean to, to, to cut their life, but rather to cutting their wrist, as what uh, explained by uh, Dr. Abbasi, it makes them feel good again, it makes them feel alive again. So will it lead to suicide if they cut themselves too much and the, the, the blood coming out too much? I'm not a medical doctor, I believe. You will die if you cut your. I mean, both of you, Doctor Nur uh, Ayman, you are a medical doctor as well. Uh, if if too much blood coming out for whatever reason that you you want to end up your pain, you just want to feel alive again. But when it cannot be controlled, definitely you will die. You may not want. You don't have. You do not. Uh, you don't even have. Uh, you don't even think that you want to kill yourself. You just want to feel alive again. But it's end up the other way around. I mean, if you want to ask, sir, is that a, a attempt suicide? Maybe not. Maybe just uh, I want to feel alive again. I just want to end up this emotional pain. I, I, I until we know exactly what in this person's mind, then we can own, make a conclusion whether actually this is an a, this the an attempt suicide. They really want to kill themselves, or actually not. Uh, there is a question that I, I, I saw in the chat room. From mm -hmm. what kind of background most of the young people attempt suicide is poor socioeconomic background, poor education status, or from educated fraternity? Um, I, I want to respond to that question. So, in my opinion, in my observation, in my very little research on this, I found that uh, suicide, attempt suicide, cut across all economic backgrounds. And definitely, I cannot deny uh, those who, with the uh, highest uh, 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 economic status, when their higher expectations uh, from parents, from, from uh, people around them, uh, uh, the likely, uh, most likely, you have higher chance to to, to to attempt suicide. Those uh, I've, to this date, I've not heard any of the aborigine, Orang Asli, I don't know if I miss, Orang Asli kill themselves to this date. And how about uh, in America? Have you heard any, any, uh, I don't know, is, is that still, you call Red Indians or whatever the term that you call for the Native aborigine Americans. there? Native uh -huh. Americans. Native, Native Americans. Americans. Yeah. Do, do yeah, you there is, a high, there is a rate of the suicide there as well? They are the highest, arguably, in the world. Right. They're the highest oh, really? in the world. Yeah. Yes. Native, yes. Ameri Native American. Yeah. In, in Malaysia, right. I've not heard that the our Aborigine Orang Asli kill themselves. I do not know if, if um, I do not know the news, but till date, uh, to date, I have not heard any of them. They no. are. In, in my opinion, they are they, they live they still live in the jungle. They like to have freedom, and they are to some extent. I think they are happier. All right, they are less pressure. They, they don't have due dates to meet. <laughs> they don't have bills to pay. No. If you look at the suicide uh, literature, that there is no discrimination based on um, socioeconomic. Uh, education um, it's kind of uh, we there's prevalence everywhere 
depending on what kind of vulnerability you are facing, what kind of stress levels you are facing, what's your coping skills, what does your resilience level, otherwise no predictors. Uh, in fact, uh, low socioeconomic status could be a big trigger and big vulnerability. Uh, that's, I also want to quickly touch base on cutting in itself, what we are seeing becoming fashionable, like you said, or uh, having a lot of teenagers uh, indulging in it. That's not really a suicide attempt. Cutting is different. Uh, cutting can be very superficial, scratching, and just again, feeling uh, it's a way of coping with the stress and pain. But what happens, what we see is that when you cut, accidentally you can cut deeper or you can cut an artery or a blood vessel, major blood vessel that can cause you to die. So just indulging in cutting is more like a coping behavior that uh, we see uh, has become common now. Uh, and uh, it could be pinching skin or pulling hair or cutting. It falls in, in some same uh, category. Mm -hmm. What about Dr. Halim? What is your opinion on the background of the people who attempt suicide? It's what uh, Dr. Bassi said. It's across the board. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as you go to different socioeconomic strata, you you can see certain orientations of things. Um, you may see that there's a little more trauma-based suicide versus loss-based, you know, expectation, things like that. I should have been in this, you know, college. I should have got this, you know, promotion. I should have got this degree. I should have got this thing, body image issues. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so there's, you know, you'll see certain niches you know, but in terms of, uh, you know, overall, some of the macro statistics, um, yeah, it's not a, um, it's not a, uh, it's not like for poor people, rich people, no. So that needs to, that needs to get out doesn't of Doesn't discriminate. No, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't at all. All right. The next question would be, um, children who are exposed to ACE, adverse childhood experience, are more likely to have suicide ideation as compared to those children who are brought up in a very positive home climate. What is Dr. Farha, Dr. Halim and Dr. Siti Aisha experience working with children with ACE? Can you share with us? So, AC is Edward Childhood Experiences, and of course, they are the biggest predictor of societal behavior uh, uh, later on in life. So these uh, are Edward Childhood Experiences are basically on a scale of 1 to 10. It could be being exposed to violence, or be it domestic violence of parents, or being exposed to psychopathology in parents, parents using drugs, or parent, or trauma directly to yourself, or like abuse, or moving away, or being in a war zone. There can be so many traumatic events. It takes away the sense of constancy and uh, object constancy, constancy in you, and you never develop that. Uh, uh, cohesive sense of self and uh, this chaos around you kind of uh, kind of make endangers your mental health uh, is responsible for horrible physical outcomes so I was reading that on a scale of one to ten if you score five or six on this uh, adverse childhood experience service then uh, survey then your life can be shortened by almost 15 years so it can be socioeconomic vulnerability. So that definitely, it's a big, big uh, challenge of our times and a big predictor of uh, suicide, uh, societal behavior. Mm, I see. What about Dr. Sida Aisha? Have you experienced working with children with ACE? Um, I would say uh, uh, because my specialization in family is most of the adversity is uh, parents undergone divorce. When the divorce is not peaceful, when, when the divorce is really uh, in a very chaotic uh, divorce, yes, they, they, they're facing this adversity. Um, again, when they come to me as a counselor, 
um, we try to help uh, to 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 for the parents how to, to they, they can come apart again they can they can come again as a, a together how they can be supportive during this uh, uh, adversity period during this uh, divorce is a traumatized uh, uh, experience to most of the children uh, how 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 good you're trying to be is really traumatized for them and uh, what makes it worse when uh, you have a high expectation with the child without, uh, without showing that, uh, being merciful that we are all are facing, I mean, I mean the, the mothers, the, 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 the parents are facing, and we, uh, this adverse, this, uh, yes, it will make them feel lonely in their own home. This is what the issues when they, they, they don't feel they are needed. And this uh, uh, make them feel that uh, why why do they live anyway? I mean, nobody needs them. Everybody is busy with their own problems, and uh, yeah, I, I just become another burden to the family. So these are things that uh, uh, I found, and uh, we're trying to uh, help the parents to uh, not uh, criticize each other more on each other, you, you are divorced, but you are not divorced with your children, you dislike your partners, your spouse, let's end up and let's work together on how to raise this child. This is how I help uh, children who is facing this uh, traumatized even in their life when parents are divorced. Why? Yeah, I've, I've worked with, um, yeah, a lot of Unfortunately, a lot of kids who, um, a lot of young people who've um, gone through a lot of adverse and traumatic experiences and things like that. Um, it, it, it really depends on, it depends on a few things, but it really depends on the, um, the support system and the healing and how, how those um, things are narrated how those things are conceptualized and how those things are 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 repackaged and brought back to a child for example a uh, you uh, know clients muslim clients who've been sexually abused when they're young how did their parents actually treat that or narrate that was it mm -hmm. their fault was it right was it wrong do you talk about it all these things so so how the events are narrated, but also how it is the support that that comes from that comes from the family, the um, friends in the community makes a big big impact. That 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 really that can really change the game when you're talking about where to put some of that pain. But if you leave it alone and kind of, you know, do whatever, then um, that's not there. So, yeah. All right. Dr. Halim, as Dr. Sidi mentioned before about mother's rules in preventing suicide through having good quality time with their children, right? What about father's rules, especially in raising teen girls who are commonly facing this problem? Can you share your opinion as a father? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Um, I have three children, a uh, 14-year-old boy, 9-year-old uh, boy, and a 7-year-old daughter. Um, let, me, let, me, let me say this. Um, the base of parenthood is, is <laughs> deep, sincere love. It is, it is it is love through and through and an unconditional love okay in our in a lot of our muslim dominated countries you know countries that are majority muslim the way that love is shown is um is culturally put forth as uh something very dry and distant and it is not how our prophet Islam, showed love to his children. And the point 
if we are being Muslim in life is to mimic and copy and, and, and behave like the prophet. When you have a little girl, a young lady, because I think that's the question, right? The daughter, yes, yes. the father, who is very sensitive about how she looks, very sensitive about um, being accepted, who's very um, worried about fitting in and things like that. And you as the main male protecting the first figure of male protection and male authority in her life, okay, are not protecting and reinforcing that, uh, reinforcing her and helping her feel safe and helping her feel beautiful and helping her feel whatever things need to be fulfilled and loved and cared and protected and safe and things like that. Because we get caught up in, in whatever we think culture tells us to be kind of straight faced and macho and distant and, you know, that, that's too much, that's too lovey-dovey, that's, that's, um, that's taboo, that's aib, that's, you know, that doesn't, um, that's, that's not tasteful, okay? That, my friends, um, as you're starting to see the trends here, is a losing formula for parenting. When you're not doing what a child actually needs, when you're not giving what they actually need. Because let me tell you something, whoever's a, I don't know how many men are on here or not, but women, um, if your father does not make you feel beautiful, okay? And I'm coming from, I'm coming from a Muslim minority country. I'm a minority as a black man in America and also a Muslim minority. We're only one or 2% of the population. Okay, that's very different than Malaysia. That's very different than the Middle East. So you look at things a very different way. There's certain things that are normal to me that are not normal to you, okay? As a Muslim, because of how society and things, how society has structured things, okay? So if a, if a, if a man does not make her daughter feel beautiful, if a man does not make her daughter, or a father does not make her daughter feel loved, a father does not make her daughter feel safe and protected or what have you. There is an innate thing inside a, a, a woman, inside a daughter, to seek some of that out from a desirable source. It's something innate. And if she doesn't get, and, and if anybody who even gives an, an illusion of it, even fakes it, even lies about it, she'll just attach many times, if she desires that, she'll attach to the lie. She'll attach, and then you wonder, you look at the relationships. Just think about the relationships, the messed up relationships that you know, that you've seen in people's lives. Think about them. And you sit back and you wonder like, man, how did you end up with this dude? Like, how did you end up with this bum? How did you end up with this guy? You know, so, so it is imperative that we really start to rethink and relook at um, how we are to, how a father, how fathers are to attach and love their daughters. Because there is no person who is more manly, more masculine, more ma macho than our prophet, okay? So I don't care, I've been to Malaysia, I've been to Middle East, I've been to Africa, I've been to, I've been to a lot of places, okay? I haven't seen a lot of men more manly than some of my friends and me, okay? <laughs> but I've, I've seen men, I've seen people strong, but it doesn't, that doesn't, this distance and this dryness and this pushing our daughters away and being unattainable and unaccessible, that doesn't make you a man. It doesn't make you a great father. It doesn't even make you a good Muslim. And then when she's running around looking for love somewhere, and then she can't find it, and then you start seeing some of this stuff, and then you criminalize her 
because while it might not be a legal criminalization, we as a mash uh Muslim, right? We may criminalize people's belief. We criminalize their iman. We criminalize this girl's value because she couldn't get into the box that we wanted her to. And that's not Islam. And that is, in these types of twisted, weird, oppressive ideas are the things that I myself fight against. So, sorry, you got me on one. So I'm gonna back off now. <laughs> All right, thank you for the sharing, Dr. Halim. So as mentioned before, the common factor among of teen girls in Malaysia are academic pressure and sexual misconduct. What about in US? Uh, can Dr. Farha share what are the common factors? Why pre adolescent children, especially girls, to have thoughts of attempting suicide? Does the song and the you know technology nowadays contribute as well? I think uh, the pressure of the society is too much on the girls. Uh, what I've seen in my 20 years in the US that we uh, the girls are growing up faster and faster. So where, what used to happen in college is happening in high school. What used to happen in high school is starting to happen in middle school. So average age of pregnancy has gone down to 14. And uh, first sexual encounter, which is usually forced uh, or uh, kind of pushed into, um, is happening even younger than that, 12, 13. So as a society, and I, I, because I'm living in America for the last 20 years and observing that, I'm not saying it's not happening in the rest of the world, but definitely what I see, the pressure on the girls is a lot more. And what the social media has done has given us this sense of how we should look like how we should behave, how uh, like eating disorders, we are seeing more and actually eating disorders are on rise in um, uh, men and boys, young boys as well. Mm -hmm. But then um, to be successful, we have defined it very in very hard terms. You have to be in school, you have to be in sports, you should be playing music you should be doing this. So there's a lot of pressure on the girls and easy accessibility of uh, like, you know, on one hand there's stress, there is no emphasis on early interventions with mental health or like, uh, like uh, if you look at the society, one and two marriages ending in divorce, and most of them get into custody battles are not really happy divorces, right? So we are seeing a lot of kids of broken marriages as well. Divorce rates are impacting the society as well. Um, then the socioeconomic meltdown in the country the political chaos in the country, all that is impacting the youth anyhow. But I think the girls are getting disproportionately affecting, affected, and especially girls um, uh, of uh, color, like, you know, um, of minorities. They are being impacted disproportionately. And then the problem is the stigma of mental illness is so high in those communities that those communities then have lowest access to mental health. So on one hand, you have high rates doubling up. Like right now, if we look at uh, suicide rates is the highest in uh, women of color aging 15 to 24 years, including our South Asian communities. Um, so that, that, but if you look at the excess of care, uh, or utilization of services is the lowest in minorities. I see. So it brings me to some, some points that um, maybe you can share, Dr. Halim and Dr. Farha, what are the, uh, the government's initiatives uh, to prevent this from happening? And maybe Dr. Siti Aisha can, can also share in terms of our Malaysian government so that we can have a good sharing for this. <laughs> 
I see on individual level, there is a lot of work being done in the mental health field. Unfortunately, we still are behind in the policies. So we do have mental health parity now in most states, which means we should have enough coverage for your physical and mental health. But in practice, we are hostage to insurances. So we, our infrastructure is not really supporting mental health uh, initiatives. Uh, that said and done, there are organizations um, like semi-private or non-profit organizations that are taking major uh, burden of this or on individual level, there is a lot of work being done. Um, I think there are initiatives. I sh it's not that there are not government-based initiatives, but we are very far behind the gap between the burden the needs versus the resources is growing every day. And I think COVID-19 especially has gonna, is gonna push this uh, pendulum in a very negative way. And that's what we are really concerned about that we will have a big mental health illnesses and crisis on our hands. All right. Can Dr. Siti Aisha uh, yeah. mention for information? I will share now. Um, okay, um, uh, if for the government initiative, there is, uh, I just came back from the uh, uh, invitation, having a meeting with the Ministry of Women, Family and Development. There is an initiative uh, organized by uh, this ministry. They, they call it Academy Kluggers Jatara. All right, uh, this academy actually trying to help uh, family, parents of how to make the family more, more sejahtera. Sejahtera here means is uh, uh, how to take care of the family well-being. And I'm sharing that in the chat room so that uh, everyone can have the, 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 the link of Academy right. of Sejahtera. So this uh, is uh, basically is a, uh, uh, for suicide, I think is a preventive and when, when parents knows how to play their roles more, how to make the family become more peaceful family, how to make it, uh, the well-being uh, taken care. I mean, despite all the challenges, life challenges, um, there are ways for us to overcome these challenges in a peaceful manner. And what most important, to have knowledge. As I said, mentioned earlier, why I'm in this field, because I feel knowledge is the key, is the key. I do not know how to raise a child when I was young, 20, 21 years old. I was all alone in the States. And what saved me, what saved my family is knowledge, how to raise a child. I don't want to put my child in a trial, experimental, right or wrong trial. Why do I have to try when there are so much knowledge, when we can learn? I mean, a wise person learn from our previous mistake, but a wiser person fr learn from other people's mistake. Why do I have to make mistake with my child raising them? I'm not saying that I'm a perfect mother, but I, I, I'm trying my best not to do wrong in raising my child. Why do I have to experiment with my child when there is a evidence showing that this is the right way how to raise a child, this is not so right way to raise a child? Why do I want to put my child in experimental uh, condition, trial and error, when, when there is so much uh, knowledge out there? So I would say that uh, this academy actually helped parents to, to learn how to raise our child uh, in, a, in a more effective, more... Uh, uh, in a better way of, of making our family a happier family, despite all the adversity. Life is far from perfect, but we can be happy, inshallah. We can be, we can be well, inshallah. Inshallah, okay. Uh, Dr. Halim, uh, there is another question from uh, the participant. Is there any relation on how supportive the parents manage child's puberty phase, which may influence any possibility of his or her suicide thoughts or behaviors? Uh, Do you copy the questions? Yeah. Is there any relation on how supportive the parents manage a child's puberty phase, 
which may influence the possibility of his or her suicidal thoughts and behavior. Yeah, I mean, any support that a parent has um, in as many phases as possible of their life is going to have a, a positive effect in, in, in combating some of the risks because they're, they'll, they'll just be more connections, more things known, um, opportunities to open up, um, more opportunities to intervene if something serious happens. There's just a lot more and a lot, um, you give yourself a lot more chances to find out if something is wrong. So, um, so yeah, obviously being supportive is, um, is, is key and is huge. Um, so that's there. And I mean, and again, our religion our um, our book and the Quran, our, our our way in the Sunnah, it really um, if you really like look at just how common sense a lot of the stuff is. Um, it really get it really like lays out a lot of basic things and and answers of just keeping people connected and happy and alive and and uh, included and fitting in and just things that really match with the heart and match with with uh, uh, that that place of where pain comes from, because the thing is this, okay? I, I, um, I think there's a lot of fear that goes out in media about a number of different things, and I'm not about um, fear mongering. Like 99% of the time, but if there is one thing that we should be very like, I would. One, I would want you kind of leaving like, oh my goodness, I really need to think about this or, or, or look at this. It's suicide, okay? It, it's, it's, it's suicide. I don't care. I don't care. I, I see there's people and doctors and, and people saying, well, all you need to do is this and this and this when, when it is not that simple, okay? Because I deal with it. I've sent people to the hospital. I've taken people out of the hospital. It is not that simple when somebody really wants to do it. I'm not talking about people who you see it coming 10 miles, 10 kilometers away. I got y'all in Malaysia, 10 kilometers away. Okay. So, um, no, I'm not talking about that. We're talking about people who are intentional about, about completing suicide. Okay. It is not that simple. And I don't, and, and, and we should be on much more high alert. This Corona thing has been out most of the year. It still hasn't reached and it still will not reach how many people just kill themselves every year. And they got everybody in the world with masks on, nobody's going to school, all this stuff. But I'm talking about like surefire death when you've gone to a certain place, when you pull a certain trigger, it is 100%, okay? And, and, and it starts with a choice. And nobody's, the, no, I don't wanna say nobody, the level of response, the level of urgency to really like be in tune with the people that just we care about and love. I'm not even saying everybody, but the people that Allah has put you in front of like the majority of your day. It's your responsibility. You should at least know what's going on in their life. Like for real. Not just like a five minute a day, like, eh, you know, type of thing. So this is something as a community, as a, as a, as a society that we need to be very scared and very terrified of. I couldn't count. There was one year we had a Muslim mental health count. I couldn't count how many funerals I went to for people in their teens coming back from the conference. It was like one a week. It got real bad with, the, with overdoses, okay? I had a young boy, I went to his funeral, I saw it. And we were at the, 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 um, the, the committee meeting and talking in the masjid with the imams and all that. And um, literally his family was in the living room. They were literally in the living room. You hear me? They're in the living room, okay? And he literally walked past them 
went into the backyard and shot himself. Okay? They were in the living room. He walked past his family. Why? Because stigma is worse than death for most people. Okay? And so, and so that is the never-ending battle. There, there will not, at least on my watch, any webinar, any place I'm in, anywhere I'm at, there will not be any shaming, any criminalizing, any, any, um, any judgment or pontification, negative pontification put on someone who, has, who, is, who, is, who is enraptured with pain and suffering and agony. Okay, this is something we do need to be very terrified about. Okay, I don't yeah. need to hear... I don't need, I'm almost done, Bashira. I, I don't need to hear no $5 fatwa hadith about whoever kills themselves, they're going to keep doing it in paradise and killing themselves or what have you. Okay? Because it is a lot, a lot deeper than that. Okay? So, All right. yeah. So that's. Uh, that's definitely something um, we as a, as a community and as a people need to be on high alert about. So that's that. So that brings um, us to another question regarding the society. So as someone who sees that um, this, uh, this situation, how can we offer help to parents who have children that attempted suicide? Because, you know, these parents sometimes they often um, blame the society for what happened to them. So what do you think, Dr. Halim and Dr. Farha? So first of all, I think uh, uh, um, I, I'm, I know this is a topic that we will never have enough discussion of. This has to be the, I think we should wrap it up after this question. Yeah. But uh, in America, we have a lot of uh, support system. There is NAMI, National Alliance for Mentally Ill. But I think as a religious community, it, the support uh, should start, like Dr. Halim Naim said, that we can't really give fatwas that this is sin and uh, this is this person's responsibility or parents' responsibility because the parents, it's when somebody completes suicide, it's, it's like almost a death, uh, kind of death for the rest of the family. The guilt, the pain and the loss, it's just um, very hard to carry and we can't make it worse by being judgmental or stigmatizing suicide. We have to accept it as a medical reality and we have to, uh, pro as a community, uh, provide that support for the families. Uh, I think for us, everything has to start with our own religious community. But then there are a lot of organizations, government, non-government, non-profit, uh, non-profit, especially I think National Alliance for Mentally Ill, then Ellie's Place. There are a lot of uh, uh, organizations that we can bring in for the support of parents. But I think it, it has to start with us first. Um, any comment from Dr. Aisha and Dr. Halim? Yeah, I you want to add. Yeah, I, I would like to add on this. Like um, when parents, when we, we are facing this uh, with our special child, again, I want to again uh, remind from the, my early uh, at the beginning actually that each child is unique because. Uh, 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 not only they are unique in terms of birth order, they are unique in the time. Each one of child having different, they have their own time zone. And they have their own uh, environment, they have their own friends, they have their own challenges. Um, and we do not, I would say same treatment is a discriminatory treatment. A child, you cannot treat second child like you treat the first child. You cannot treat the third child as you treat the second one because each one of them is unique. I've always heard parents say that, how come this child, I treat them all the same. 
and then I saw I smile and say that that that's actually the problem when you treat your child as a same human being each one of them is unique each one of them has different needs and each one have different attention to be given so when you have child this unique child having special special emotional disturbance do not treat them like others and especially uh, the the extended family when we have little knowledge do not give unsolicited advice perhaps this very unique child have some kind of mental health problems do not trying to give advice when you don't we do not know the reality world of this very unique child so this um i would i think uh, enough for, for from me that the last message the take home message i want to give that we have to treat each of our child uniquely differently they are special in their own way we have to pre appreciate the way they are do not compare with anybody anybody at all and worst thing you compare to yourself look i'm also i was a young adolescent then you know i don't treat this way that way no that's i think that the worst thing that they will end up saying i'm not as good as you are i can come i cannot meet your standard so this is my last take home message that um, each one of our child is unique give a special attention for their needs yeah real quick because we're we're getting towards a you know couple hours fundamentally this comes down to just like the dr c dasha was saying this comes down to the dynamic but through the parent and the child this issue okay fundamentally if you want to narrow it down community mas this that school teachers or what have you fundamentally we need to focus and hone in on a certain relationship that needs to be enhanced it's a parent and child relationship but both have to be at a certain level of awareness of connection and of of um it's past our bedtime here yeah this past i'm oh, sorry I'm reading stuff. Um, it's got to be, it, we have to be extremely um, on point in terms of our connection, our relationship to our children, because that's what it comes down to. Suicide is a, is, is a, is started, whatever it is, is started in the family. And it may be indicative of certain things, certain breakdowns, certain symptoms, whatever, or not, you know, maybe a family does too good of a job. We call that spoiling. You know, there, there's a number of different things that happen, but this has got to be a uh, top priority, one of the top priorities that we're, um, that we're addressing. And it comes down to a parent and child and that's that connection and that love and that, um, and that bond. So that's what it is. Let's be on high alert. Let's really take a look and another look at our family, at our communities, as, at our friends, at everybody. Please do not be the next. Uh, I've had some close people lose their life in my life. And I wished I could look around. So I wished I could have seen something again. Please do not go through what I've gone through with this. Please take a look at your families all over again. Don't assume you have everything figured out because you probably don't. And, and really take a look and see um, if there's some deeper level of pain. Please. But thank you everybody. Jazakallah khair. And uh, hopefully we can do this another time. <laughs> all right mashallah okay just for all the speakers looks like we looks like we already answered some of the questions but we do have a new questions i'll suggest the speakers to answer personally to the people uh participants so thank you all for, for participating this discussion now i will hand back the floor to ayman please ayman okay thank you bashira 
Thank you very much to our panelists, Dr. Halim Naim, Dr. Farha Abasi, and Dr. Siti Aisha Hassan for a very enlightening and very informative answers. We are now at the end of our session. I have an important uh, announcement for our participants regarding the certificate of participation. Michigan State University will send it to you after you submit your feedback questionnaires via email. And a recording of this webinar will be posted later in a YouTube and Facebook platform, YouTube Muslim Mental Health Conference and Facebook Association of Muslima in Nurture and Advocacy, AMNA. And before we log off, I would like to wish our Muslim viewers Salam al-Hijrah, best wishes for the new year. And thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. May we meet again in the next program. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.